so this is my fifth time here, which is kind of amazing. Um, and I was looking back at all of my slide decks over the last five years, and it's, uh, it's a bit Groundhog Day-esque in that they're all essentially about the same thing, except each year there's like a little bit more to tell. It's like, you know, it's like we're actually busy, like we write code, we have new ideas, we assemble those ideas into something concrete. Um, and four years ago, um, you know, I, I felt very strongly that that we should work to create some kind of environment for collaboration that spanned across different data science communities that, you know, the R community, the Python community, uh, other communities have worked very hard to build very nice tools that have made us all a lot more productive, but there's very little cross-pollination of, of code. And in part, what, what has been driving that is the lack of um, anything meaningful to collaborate on. So when you look inside, you know, what's inside R, what's inside Python, it's all different and incompatible. So we need to create some kind of a compatible technology that we can use in all of the places. So that's how this all came about. Um, so about a year ago, um, I partnered with RStudio to found Ursa Labs, which is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we are building shared, you know, portable computational libraries for data science. It's focused on the Apache Arrow project. Um, I've been, you know, building the building the team and um, fundraising over the last um, over the last year, and that's that's all been been going really well. Um, so our studio has been really gracious not only to hire me, but but also to uh, to help with the um, the HR and administration of the organization, so that I can spend my time um, writing code and less time worrying about. Um, you know, payroll and, and healthcare benefits because you know healthcare benefits is something we have to you have to worry about when you have a company. Um, so we have a couple of uh, you know really great um, you know big sponsors in Two Sigma and Nvidia uh, who have respectively done a lot for the Eros ecosystem um, over the last couple of years uh, and I'm working on uh, a number of partnerships that I'll. Hopefully we'll add to this slide, um, and you know, if I get invited, invite, invited back and this talk isn't, you know, it gets more and more technical as the years go by, so maybe Jared will invite me back, like five years is enough, Wes. Um, but uh, so, you know, we, we wanted to pursue something different with this organization, so rather than engaging in contract work where, you know, I think often open source developers will do um, sort of work for hire arrangements for different companies where, it's like, you know, we give you this money, you build this feature, as soon as that feature is done, um, you know, we're, we're out, you know, we're not, you know, we're not involved anymore. But I think what's, what gets missed in that process is a lot of the unseen labor and open source around maintenance, community development, and all of the little things that, that fall through the cracks. And so we wanted to find um, people to sponsor this work who are really committed to the vision of the project and who also want to be contributing code and helping, helping the project grow. Uh, and so far, that's been so far that's been going really well. So we we founded this in kind of the abbreviated background. Um, so throughout uh, 2015, so I worked with a bunch of people out on the West Coast, uh, mostly in the in the big data ecosystem, to um, to put together this this open source project. And these and the idea was that we wanted to create um, a column oriented, essentially data frame format that we could use in many different types of systems. So we could use them in Java applications that are more traditional Spark, Hadoop, um, things that are traditionally incompatible with, with Python and R, but, but would also be suitable in the data science languages. So it would be fast for analytics. It could be used um, for moving data very quickly between different runtime environments. So we could very seamlessly transition from like a big distributed database to a single node, you know, laptop running, uh, running Python, uh, Python and R. So the project started small just to see if we could even get, you know, dozens of people around the world working on different open source projects to agree on, you know, the exact byte and bit layout of what is, you know, what is a table in memory. Like that alone was a very difficult process, you, you might imagine. Um, but since then, we've been expanding the project into kind of a project of projects where uh, we're now calling it a development platform where we have libraries across many languages that help with creating data processing applications. And for me, the most important thing is that there's been all of this technology, you know, technology innovation that's happened in the analytic database world around performance and scalability for analytics. 
And almost none of that has made its way into the hands of data scientists. So if you look at the database literature, like what's going on inside you know, column databases like Redshift, ClickHouse, BigQuery, Impala, Dremio, Presto, you know, I keep name, there's like all these database systems. But if you look internally, there's all this like high end systems work and just in time compilation. And we have like, you know, and we, we have pandas, we have dplyr, and it's great, but it could be a lot better. So working with the database community is, is one of the big goals uh, of this project. So, you know, simplified view, incompatible data formats, we lose a lot of time uh, and productivity serializing and converting data between systems. We'd like to have a common format um, that if two systems use Arrow, they can move data around gracefully and not have all of this conversion. So the project is divided into two um, kind of two pieces. So the first is a set of specification documents for what is a table, and the second is a large group of libraries, which now include uh, a total of 11 programming languages. Um, I've got to add MATLAB. I don't know why I missed it. I'm sorry, MATLAB. Um, MATLAB. The MATLAB folks have actually been really great and have made some, some nice contributions to the project. Um, I've been focused on the C++ project, so we're going to go all C++, C++ from, from here on in. So the, the way that the project is, is architected and the way that we think about the world and is we've, we've first focused on building you know, what I call the, the core data platform of how we handle and manipulate tabular data in memory, how we manage, like, how we manage memory, um, how we move it around, how we serialize it. Like if somebody sends us a bunch of data, like how do I interpret that data as being, as being a data frame? And we're building um, three pretty big components that, um, that interact with that core data platform. So I will tell you more uh, about those. So the first is a data sets framework. So that's about, I have a slide about it. So why don't I just wait and I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so core platform, um, the tabular format, memory management. We have a binary protocol for sending data around. We, do, we deal with memory mapping. Um, so very quickly in about 60 seconds or less, I'm going to show you why we might care about this. So here's one of my favorite data sets to analyze, the 2012 FEC election donation data set. And I like analyzing this, this data set from the US presidential election in 2012 because it reminds me of this very innocent time <laughs> seven years ago when like the big controversies of, were when Mitt Romney said that corporations are people, you know, just it was an innocent time. So, uh, so I'm going to read that data set, uh, do a little data munging, um, convert it from pandas to arrow format. So now we have the arrow schema. It has a bunch of metadata so that we can go round trip to pandas and fix like pandas' indexes and weird stuff in pandas. Um, and so Arrow tells us that we have allocated about 150 megabytes in memory. And now what I'm going to do is write 50 copies um, of that table in a, in a stream, in, in a file. So basically, I'm laying out um, 50 copies of the, of the file end to end in the Arrow format in a file. And so that's done. So now I've got um, a little over 8 gigabyte file in, um, in that directory. And so now for the party trick, I'm going to restart my Jupyter kernel. So now I have no data in memory at all. So zero allocated bytes. And now I'm going to memory map the file and read it into memory. It has 50 chunks. And I can you know, compute an analytic on some column in the data set. And it runs pretty much instantaneously. So if you work with large data sets and you have limited RAM, this stuff is really important to get right. And we've, we've invested a lot of energy in laying a proper foundation that we can build on for the next you know, decade and beyond. Um, of course, to have this, this data platform and to not be able to get data in and out isn't very useful. So, uh, so one of our major initiatives over the next year or so is building out a comprehensive data sets framework for interacting with very large data sets that consist of multiple files. And you don't always always have data on your laptop, so sometimes you do, but it may live in a number of distributed and remote file systems, so we need to support all of those. And data stored in many different, uh, I shouldn't just not move the mouse, but data stored in many different file formats. Um, so I've been one of the lead developers on a C++ implementation of Parquet, which has become a really popular data warehousing format uh, for analytical data sets. Uh, we've developed a multi-threaded CSV reader that's all in C++, multi-threaded JSON reader. 
Uh, we have an adapter to Apache Orc, which is a, essentially a competitor or an alternative to Parquet for columnar storage. Um, so at a, at a high level, like we want you to be able to read and write your data sets in, wherever they are and whatever their format, in whatever format they're stored as fast as possible. And also we want, whenever you're doing an analysis, that the framework can, is, is smart enough to only read the parts of the data set that you need to perform your query. So if you're using dplyr, then dplyr can send its filters down into the, the data sets layer to exclude files from, from being deserialized. So on top of this, um, we're also developing a, a kind of single node, multi-threaded uh, query engine that can be embedded in Python and R applications and many different places. And the goal is to be able to execute you know, kind of the equivalent of SQL and dplyr style queries. So where query is sort of a, a loose term, you know, the, the stuff that you write when you're using data.table or using dplyr, um, if you express that in a syntax tree and then send it into the query engine, then we can evaluate that. Um, another cool thing that we're, that we're building um, is a framework called Flight, which is a messaging framework for building distributed applications. And so if you've ever interacted with a database, and I mo imagine that most people in this room have, it's usually pretty slow to get data through a network connection. And we wanted to have essentially you know, one of the fastest solutions for moving large data sets around uh, in a network. We're building on top of Google's gRPC library. Um, and by avoiding um, unnecessary serialization on the receiver side, and doing as little work as possible on the server side, um, you know, without taking into account the cost of moving bytes through kind of through your network. So depending on how fast your network is, um, like just on my laptop from client to server, I'm able to move about three gigabytes per second, which you know, compared to other protocols for moving data, is pretty remarkable. Um, so let's talk about R. So luckily, this has all been about C++, but R has this really great thing called RCPP. Um, and one of my colleagues is Romain Francois, who is one of the core developers of RCPP. So we've got great expertise to develop really high quality usable bindings to these libraries that can be used in R to build um, uh, analytics and data toolkits uh, for R. So we've started doing that. It's a subtree within, within the Apache Arrow code base. And we want to basically expose as much of the functionality that we're building in the core libraries so that package developers in R can use those tools to build faster and more interoperable data processing uh, tools in, in R. So one question that people often have is how, is, how are Arrow data frames or Arrow tables different from R data frames? Uh, the short story is that um, the concept of null or the concept of NA um, are represented by bits instead of special values. And that's partly because we have so many data types that it would be really onerous to define all of these different conventions for storing nulls. So we have a single way that we represent nulls in all types. Um, the way that we deal with strings is a lot more efficient for analytics because every string in a column is right next to the previous one. So there's no like cache misses when you're looking up um, data in DRAM. The data is chunked, so if you saw in my demo, like I had fit a large eight gigabyte data set that was in 50 pieces, so I don't have to read all of the pieces and then go through a, an expensive, uh, what's the word, H stack, or it's like some R function that does like concatenates data frames. Um, you don't have to do that because the assumption is the data is chunked, it may be streaming, um, so you don't have to uh, convert it to a contiguous, uh, contiguous form. Uh, we also support uh, a wider variety of data types, including nested types. So if you have um, lists of things or dictionaries of things, so essentially the, the algebra of JSON, we can re represent that natively and all in a form that's efficient for, uh, for analytics. So, so the things that I'm really excited about for the, for the R community, so one big thing is being able to memory map and interact with extremely big data frames. This is not new functionality, so if you're familiar with XDF from uh, from, from Revo R, um, that's, you know, some, some uh, there's a number of R packages, both proprietary and open source for memory mapping large, large data frames. Um, but this is something that is not R specific, um, can be used um, sort of by anyone who's using these libraries. Uh, we want to be able to accelerate uh, dplyr um, and, you know, other libraries that, that, that want to use the, um, use the software uh, to be able to run queries directly against large data sets on disk. 
Uh, we want to make it easier for you to interact with exotic uh, file formats like, like Parquet and not have to create a custom implementation that's only used in R and have to maintain that because uh, it's quite difficult to build and maintain. Um, and there's some other, other fun things. Um, so one thing that's not on here um, that, uh, that, we, that we did is we, um, over the last couple of years, so initially uh, my colleagues and I and some folks at IBM uh, did an Arrow integration inside Apache Spark uh, for accelerating Python on Spark, but we kind of left the R folks uh, out, of, out of the fun. Uh, that has since been remedied, and uh, um, so Javier and Roman uh, worked on uh, accelerating R on, on Spark through Sparkly R, and in copying data out of Spark into R, they were able to make it about, I think about 16 times faster. So this is the, the, R, the Arrow data, this is the original Sparkly R version. Um, in executing R functions against uh, Spark data frames, we're able to make it about 40 times, 40 times faster. So, uh, so in terms of productivity and interactivity, you know, this sort of making data more efficient, moving between systems really makes a big impact in, in your ability to get in your ability to get stuff done. Um, another question I get a lot is what about Feather? So three years ago, uh, Hadley and I had just created the Feather format. And this was a quick experiment or prototype uh, to use the Arrow format to define an interoperable storage layer for data frames. Um, so we haven't done that much development on the project over the last three years. And the goal is to replace the internals of the current Feather format with the official um, you know, hardened and stable Arrow binary protocol. Uh, I think we'll still call it Feather, um, but basically it will get faster and faster as we keep making improvements to the, to the, core, to the core libraries. Um, so with my last 90 seconds, I want to talk about dplyr. So if you use dplyr, essentially you're already familiar with and using a, a domain-specific language for writing uh, queries. So you select, filter, group by, you aggregate, you join. So what our goal is to do is to take a dplyr expression, which is already an unevaluated uh, S expression in R, to have the input be an arrow data set, so it need not be in memory as an R data frame. We can take all of the dplyr verbs and translate those to the equivalent uh, operators uh, in arrow land. And we can even do fun things like take the, the expressions inside the, inside the dplyr operators and compile those just in time with LLVM to make even faster versions of them and not have to run them through an interpreter. So this is a, you know, obviously a big project, but this is where we're headed. And uh, I'll be excited to you know, show more stuff a year from now if I get invited back. So thanks for, thanks for having me.